Today we're moving on to one of the most controversial novels in English literature, Matthew Lewis, The Monk. It's a classic of Gothic. It's a classic. <laughs> it's a classic of Gothic fiction, but when it originally came out in 1796, it caused a scandal. Critics denounced it as blasphemous, immoral, and dangerous. Lewis, who was only 20 at the time, had to tone it down, beginning with the fourth edition, to avoid prosecution and imprisonment. Now, while reviewers are busy dismissing this book as unreadable, the public was avidly reading it in English, French, German, and Russian. What was so scandalous about this book? One of our purposes here is to find out. But first, we need to learn the basics about the Gothic as a genre. You certainly know some examples of the Gothic, such as Dracula and Frankenstein, and maybe some of you may have read novels by Anne Radcliffe, a popular Gothic novelist satirized by Jane Austen in Northanger Abbey. But what is it that makes all of these novels Gothic? What is the Gothic? That's a good question. And it's not the only good question we can ask when we're talking about 18th century Gothic novels. Another question would be whether they're novels at all. Here's the thing, if you turn to the title pages of such novels, you often find that their authors describe them as romances rather than novels. And guess what? Matthew Lewis did the same with The Monk. So are these novels or romances, and what is it that makes them gothic? The best way to find out... Ah! The best way to understand this is to look at what these words meant back in the day when the works were being written. So let's do that, and let's begin with the word romance. Okay, this is a tricky one precisely because it seems simple. If you have to learn one thing from this lecture, it should be this. The word romance didn't mean what it means today. For us, romance is a type of relationship, a love relationship. Rom-coms are love stories, and romance novels are novels about love. Not so in the 18th century. The notion that romance refers to a type of relationship only emerges in English in the 19th century. For 18th century readers, romance was a literary genre. It originally referred to a certain type of medieval narrative in verse, like the Romance of the Rose or the Arthurian Romances of Chrétien de Troyes. And these narratives were called romances because they were written in Romance languages. A Romance language, in case you don't know, is a language descended from Latin. French, Italian, Spanish, and my native language, Portuguese, are Romance languages. In the 17th century, romances also came to be written in prose, especially in France, and they could be extremely long. The Great Cyrus by Madeleine de Scudéry was 13,000 pages. What were romances about? Well, love is one of the things they were about, but that's not their most notable feature. Remember that romances were called romances because they were written in romance languages, not because they were love stories. The most salient feature of romances, whether in verse or prose, is that they weren't about common people like you and me. Everything in them was bigger than life. If you think the Lord of the Rings, you're close to the imaginative world of romance. Vast landscapes with warriors traveling long distances on a quest for a treasure or a kidnapped princess. The protagonists of romance were usually kings and knights rescuing damsels from evil lords, wizards, and dragons. Their narrative style is grandiose, and the characters are idealized as unusually beautiful and noble. 19th century paintings like this one capture something of romance aesthetics. This isn't the world of common people living their everyday lives. It's a world of brave knights and virtuous damsels. So when 18th century critics thought of romance, they thought of this narrative genre. You can tell that it's very different than the realist novel. In fact, people in the 18th century were quite aware of this difference. Listen to the novelist Clara Reeve. The romance is a heroic fable which treats of fabulous persons and things. The novel is a picture of real life and manners and of the times in which it is written. The romance in lofty and elevated language describes what never happened nor is likely to happen. The novel gives a familiar relation to such things as may happen to our friends or to ourselves. If you had to put this very briefly, you could say that romances are idealized and novels are realistic. To get back to our topic, when Matthew Lewis says in the title page of The Monk that this is a romance, it doesn't mean that this is a love story or anything resembling a rom-com. 
What he means is that the book resembles those medieval narratives called romances. His characters are idealized, most of them are noblemen and noble women, the language is pretty elevated. And even though love is an important part of this story, this is also a story about quests, about dangerous roads and supernatural enemies. Now, if Lewis called his work a romance, why are we calling it a novel? It is essentially because we have come to use the word novel to describe books that were not described as novels at the time. A journal of the plague year was not a novel, it was a journal. Similarly, there are lots of works from the late 18th century that were described as romances, but now we consider them to be part of the history of the novel. It's interesting that they illustrate how the novel moved beyond realism and came to incorporate elements from earlier narrative traditions, such as that of romance itself. Let's turn then to the second of our critical terms, the Gothic. When we say Gothic today, we mean a kind of aesthetic. Something shared by cathedrals, goth bands, Halloween costumes, and vampires. But the word Gothic originally referred to the Goths, ancient Germanic tribes who lived off the borders of the Roman Empire. What do the Goths have to do with the Gothic? In order to get the answer, we should go back to the 18th century. The word Gothic was already in circulation at the time, and it meant a number of different things. It could be used to apply to cathedrals, to the game of chess, to people of color, to the Middle Ages, to puns. And some of these uses were derogatory. To be Gothic was to be what, in the eyes of the English, was barbaric or alien or exotic or unsophisticated or uncivilized. And some of these uses could also be flattering. They could indicate that something is ancient or venerable. The English constitution, which was taken to date back to the 13th century Magna Carta, was Gothic in precisely that sense. Now, in most cases, the word Gothic really meant medieval. And this helps to account for why Gothic can apply today both to cathedrals and to vampires. Here's how the transition happened. In 1764, the English dandy Horace Walpole published a short book entitled The Castle of Otranto. Walpole claimed to be combining two types of narrative, the ones we now call romance and the novel, and he called it that mix a Gothic story. The Castle of Otranto is a supernatural story set in medieval Italy and the main characters are aristocrats colliding in a haunted castle. It was also a successful book, and today it's considered the first Gothic novel. Not long after, the novelist Clara Reeve, the same one who gave us a distinction between romance and novel, published a Gothic narrative entitled The Old English Baron, and she describes it as follows. This story is the literary offspring of the castle of Otranto, written upon the same plan with the design to unite the most attractive and interesting circumstances of the ancient romance and modern novel. It is distinguished by the appellation of a gothic story, being a picture of gothic times and manners. Thus, gothic pictures are gothic because they are about gothic times, the Middle Ages. Most gothic novels, the monk included, are not set in the times when they were written. They are set in some kind of vague, remote past. And because the first Gothic novel was also a story of a haunted castle, the supernatural came to seem an integral part of Gothic novels. They are novels about sorceries and curses and prophecies and all sorts of supernatural entities. Some critics at the time called it the terrorist system of novel writing. Now that we know what a romance is and where the term Gothic comes from, we can ask what that tells us about the monk. It's a good question, so I'll invite you to think about it. The sections we're reading this week involve two separate storylines that may seem disconnected. The story of the monk, Ambrosio, and the mysterious novice, Rosario, and the parallel story of Lorenzo and his friends. In both cases, love is an important component of the story, but these are also tales of suspense, persecution, and horror. This book can be quite exciting to read, but the effect is different than the effect of a book like A Journal of the Plague Year. The language is elevated and literary, quite unlike Defoe's journalistic English. In other words, here we're clearly dealing with the excitements of fiction, whereas in Defoe, things were quite close to real life. What should you be reading for? Well, really, anything that stands out to you, but here are two things that you may decide to focus on. First, what do you make of the fact that this book is set in Spain rather than England? What is it that makes Madrid a better setting for this novel than, say, London? And secondly, since this is a course about the history of the novel. What are some important formal differences between this book and A Journal of the Plague Year? Does this look more like a novel to you? If yes, 
why. This is it for now. Enjoy the reading.